Welcome to the Artful Entrepreneur. Today, I have guest Mike Hathcote. He is an award-winning voiceover artist, and he's here to tell us all about being a voiceover artist. So like quick story, I actually did voiceover once for a commercial that I did years ago in my 20s. The guy was doing a favor for his friend, so he's kind of doing it on trade. And so I not only got to act in the commercial, but I also got to do the voiceover work for it. So it was pretty cool. It's fun. It was a lot of fun. And somewhere I have the VHS. I, I need to go ahead and, and dig it out and make it digital so everybody can laugh. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's fine because you, you've got a very pleasant voice. I think you'd be good at it. Thank you. Well, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and how you became a voiceover artist? Sure. I started doing radio back in 1995, thinking that that was the career that I would want to go for, for, for my life. And, and I did it for a few years. And then I had the chance to go off and be a professional skateboarder, which at the time was another one of my passions. And I figured while I was young and breakable, I would go do that. So I kind of put the radio career on hold while I went off and did the skating thing. And then have recently come back to it, I'd say in the last 10, 12 years, I decided that, you know what, I think it's time to get back into that. So that's kind of what I've been doing since. And as far as before that, I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, born and raised there. And so I'm now living in Phoenix and a whole lot's happened in between those two things. But yeah, so that's kind of what led me into my current role as a, a VO talent. Nice. And how did you get into teaching other voiceover artists? Oh, wow. After becoming a voiceover, a full-time voiceover talent, I started getting lots of requests just from, you know, friends and, you know, people on social media that wanted to kind of give it a shot themselves. You know, these days when you're on social media, you can, you know, put some of your content out there and, you know, your friends may say, Hey, you know, that sounds really great. I, you know, I've always been told I have a nice voice. Why, how do I get into that? You know, how do I get started? And enough people started doing that that I was like, well, shoot, I might as well start putting something together that is an actual, you know, kind of a course on how to do that. And so that's kind of what I've been doing for the last three or four years. In addition to doing my, my day job, which is VO, also teaching it. I think that makes perfect sense. And I feel like it's a natural transition to when you get good at something, people start asking you, it's the same thing you know, with my photography work and you start getting people to, you know, like they ask, you know, can you mentor me? So I take that as a compliment. It means that you're doing a great job. And, but what are the keys, you know, qualities or skills I think that you, that a voiceover artist needs to have? Good question. So I think the, the main, the main thing these days is tech skills, you know, you know, you you would, a lot of people would think, well, I just have to have a nice voice. Well, I, you know, but these days you don't really have to have a nice voice, you know, and really what is a quote unquote nice voice, right? I mean, you don't have to sound like Morgan Freeman or, you know, Sam Elliott or who, who Scarlett Johansson, you know, some of the top Hollywood VO talent. You just have to be believable. And so when it comes to skills, you don't really have to have a lot of vocal well you do have to have vocal ability but you don't have to have some sort of silky smooth voice you just have to be real and believable and you know make somebody you know learn something buy something click something be entertained somehow and you're in but really as far as the skills go it's really more about the performance and sounding like you're not reading because a lot of people think that vo mm -hmm. talent and, and voiceover industry in general is you turn on the microphone and you read out loud and you get paid. <laughs> and, you know, that's not really it. You, you got to sound like you're not reading. You got to sound like it's coming from here instead of just coming off of a page. And so that's probably the, the most important skill that you have to have is that ability to, to, to sound like you're not reading the text. Yeah, you're essentially acting, but you're not doing it on camera. It's right. like acting off camera, basically. And it's a good point because I think it's even more, I think it's even more difficult to do voice acting because on 
TV or, you know, on screen acting or on stage acting, you've got your face, you've got your wardrobe, you've got your sets and everything to convey the message. Whereas in this game, you just got your voice. And so that's everything. You have to be able to emote those feelings and emotions all with your vo uh, voice. So that's probably the biggest thing. But now going back to the technical side of things, you know, 20, 30 years ago before the, you know, technology boom that we've been experiencing, you really just kind of had to sit around and wait for a call from your agent. Hey, I got you an audition. And then you get in the car, you go down to the, to the studio, you do your audition, you come back home and you sit by the phone, <clears throat> see if you got the, the job, you get the job, you go back down to the studio, you step in the booth, there's an engineer, you read your text, whatever, you leave and hopefully you get paid. Those are, that paradigm has long gone. Nowadays, you've got to be your entire, everything, engineer, recording, I mean, all that, it's all on you. Oh, that's true. Yep. So, so you kind of have to wear all those hats. So that's why when I say you have to be technically savvy, then that's, that's hugely important or else you're just kind of stuck. Oh, that's a good point. I would have never thought about that. Yeah. So besides being believable and technically talented, like what tips do you have for, or advice for aspiring voiceover artists? If you're, if you're looking to get into the game, it's not, you can, you can do work just like you know, the typical voiceover work people think of when they think of voiceovers is commercials and maybe animated, you know, like, you know, cartoons and stuff like that. But there is a whole world of VO opportunities out there that don't involve that sort of, you know, you know, a high profile type work. Sure. That's great to get that kind of work, but if you're not in LA or New York, it's going to be a lot harder. And if, also, if you're not in the union, it's even going to be even more harder, more hard. <laughs> you know, right now the, the union's having a strike, right? So mm -hmm. if you're in the union, there's a lot of stuff you can and can't do now. But, and I'm non-union, by the way, so I'm, I'm not in, involved in any of that. But what you need to do, though, is focus on things that will actually make you a living in between those big, high-profile jobs. Things like e-learning, explainer videos, you know, audio books. I had just, uh, I just released an audio book today or, or an audio book that I did the work for released today. And so those kinds of jobs, it, it, you know, they're not sexy, but they pay the bills. And so if you're trying to do this full time as a, you know, an up and coming voice talent, you need to go, go out and get everything. Try not to pigeonhole yourself in one specific genre. Because if you, you kind of are that myopic and, and, and are only focused on that small thing, you're going to miss all the opportunities around. That's good advice. So basically, it sounds like take anything and everything you can get. <laughs> kind of. I mean, at the beginning, yeah, that's kind of the, the case. I mean, now, yeah. you know, I would advise people to not do like free work or, or super low paying, you know, stuff. But but yeah, I mean, a lot of people, when they first get into this business, they say, well, what's my niche or niche? You know, what is the niche that I need to be aiming for? And my answer to that is let the market decide what your niche is. Yeah. Go out and get it all. And then if you find that, hey, I, I'm getting more commercial work, maybe that's one of your niches. I, I, like I said, I don't even consider myself to even have a niche. I try to do yeah. it all because I don't want to leave anything on the table. I think that's a good attitude to have. I mean, at least now in my line of work with boudoir photography, I mean, that is very specific. So, you know, there are certain industries, I think, that lend themselves better to niching down, but apparently voiceover work isn't one of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got a, and especially in that, in that line of work, I'm sure there's plenty, depending on where you live, I'm sure there's plenty of opportunities for that. But once again, because we are a worldwide market now, I mean, I have clients not just in the U.S., but all over the world. Lots of people out there need American voices that aren't American, you know. So I'm always doing work for people overseas. So always keep that in mind that it's a big old pond and you can fish in it anywhere you want. And that's, I just, I love that, that you can do work from anywhere in the world now. Yeah. But again, that's something I would have never thought about an application 
for voiceover. Yeah. What's great about that, and, and, and it's great that you mentioned that, is that, yes, you can do this job for anyone in the world from anywhere anywhere in the world. As long as you have a very nice, you know, a way to treat your space, your recording space, you obviously can't travel in a, a booth like, you know, what I'm sitting in right now all over the place, but you'd be amazed at how, <laughs> at the at the pillow forts that I've built over the years in hotel rooms or, you know, in Airbnbs and, you know, all these other places where, you know, I can just go there and work, set up my blanket fort, get inside there with my laptop and my microphone and get to work. So it's kind of cool to be able to have that mobility. That is cool. That might be something I need to look into while <laughs> doing the, the podcast. Yeah. Well, a lot of people do it as a side hustle and then they kind of either work their way up in it until they can leave their nine to five or mm -hmm. they just continue it as a side hustle and just to kind of bring in a little extra on the side. Super cool. Well, obviously, I, I think the demand probably for voiceover work sounds like it's increasing. I mean, based upon what you're telling me. Yeah. So, I mean, how have you watched the, the industry evolve over the years? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously the internet has exploded in, in video content. I think 80 plus percent of all internet content is video right now. And those videos wow. need voices. You know, it could be a, an advertisement. It can be a product, you know, tutorial. It could be, you know, I mean, so many different applications. And even things like, this is a, kind of an extreme example, but when you go to get gas and you're filling up your car and some of the newer stations, they've got that little screen on the, on the gas tank, you know, that tells you the weather and the headlines and stuff like that. Somebody got paid for that to do the voice for that. Right. So if you go throughout your day and you think about how many times you hear some disembodied voice, <laughs> you know, whether it be, you know, at the airport telling you what, which terminal it is you're getting off at or, you know, on the radio station, on TV. I mean, it's everywhere. The gas station and, was a great example, by the way. Really, yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, who would have thought, right? And so, yeah, I mean, all of that is people, people get paid for doing the voices of all that stuff. It's not just cartoons and commercials anymore. So as a voiceover coach, what would you say are some common challenges that your students face, you know, when they're just starting out and how do you help them overcome those challenges? Like I mentioned before, the, the biggest hurdle to overcome is the performance aspect. Some people kind of have natural talent when they first start this. They either they have an acting background, you know, maybe they, they did local theater or, you know, maybe they did some on-camera stuff for commercials or whatever. But most people think that it is just reading out loud. And that's really not the case. So my job is to give them the tricks and tools and techniques to, to do to not sound like they're reading. And there are a few little special, let's call them hacks, that will actually help you to do that so that you're not sounding so stiff and robotic. So we kind of cover that kind of stuff in the performance side of things. All right. That makes sense. Well, what kind of tips do you have for, for finding voiceover work? So the first thing you need to do for finding voiceover work is have a, a really solid voiceover demo. Your demo is kind of like your calling card. It's your, your first impression. It's, it's to show people what you can do behind a microphone. So your demo is, is everywhere. It should be on a website. It should be on all your social media channels. It's, it's the way that people can find out, you know, what you can do for them. So number one, get the coaching to actually be able to deliver the performance. And once that's in, in place, then you record your demo and some people will do a commercial demo, which kind of is able to show the most range because you can go anywhere from, you know, a warm, sincere, trustworthy read, like for a hospital to a, a high energy, you know, this weekend at the Ashley Home Store's 4th of July sale, you know, some really high, you know, high energy read. You can really show a big swing in, in styles on that demo. And so that's why a lot of people start with a commercial demo. And once you actually got that demo and you've got it on a website where people can access it, then it's just a matter of going out and reaching out to the places who hire for voiceover, which are production companies, you know, video production companies, commercial production, audiobook narr or audiobook publishers, 
there's lots and lots of places, but really Google is your friend when it comes to that. Yeah. So once you have your demo on your website, then it's just a matter of Googling the places to, to go out and find the work places like, you know, video production houses, audiobook publishers, you know, commercial production, just going and introducing yourself to those people. So do you ever run any online ads like Google or Facebook to find work? No, I, I haven't found that to be very fruitful. Really, it's it's kind of organic. Okay. But but there are places you can go, like there are platforms that you can join that are all about finding voiceovers. So then there's plenty of them. <coughs> Excuse me. And those are those are great places to go find work too. Okay. So what are some misconceptions or myths about the voiceover industry that you've come across? How do you address them in your coaching? Let's see. Well, the first myth is that one I mentioned before is that you don't have to have a good voice. You know, once again, it's not like the old paradigm where you had to have that slick, polished, you know, radio voice. Hey, welcome back. You know, you don't have to sound like that. You just have to be real. That's the number one misconception. And then I guess the second one is you're not just reading out loud. A lot of people think they can do it because they think, oh, I tell you, know, I can do that. You just get this script and just read it into a microphone. No, that's not it. So those are probably the biggest misconceptions. So we have to break those down. And even going from radio to VO like I did, in radio, you kind of used to have that, you know, have to have that sound. You kind of had to have that slick, polished, you know, voice. So I had to unlearn a lot of what I had done in radio to do what I do currently. Oh, that's so interesting. That makes yeah. sense though. Yeah. So well, kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier when we were talking about finding work, you know, networking is a huge part of any entrepreneurial endeavor, I guess. So, you know, what would, what advice would you give for voiceover artists to network and market effectively? Social media is huge. You know, get on all the social media channels you can. It's especially LinkedIn, by the way. LinkedIn is probably my favorite for networking. Join some Facebook groups, you know, some VO Facebook groups that uh, you can get tips and tricks and kind of share wins and stories and stuff. But as far as finding the work, you know, actually doing the networking to find the work, really, it's really all on you because you are your own marketer. Once again, you don't have, I mean, you can have an agent. I have four agents and they're great, you know, and I get work from them. But if I had to rely on those agents, I'd starve. It's really all on you to go out and get the work. And social media is great for that. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's probably another skill that I would say would be necessary would be being able to take the initiative. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people you know, would probably be interested in doing something like this full time. And we kind of talked about how to, how to do that, which was to kind of generalize, take all the work that you can, you know, yeah. use social media, uh, <clears throat> Google is your friend. Uh, what other, you know, steps would you say that I might need to do if I wanted to become a full, full time voiceover artist? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're planning on doing it full time, take your time you know, do the research. One of the biggest hurdles that a lot of people need to overcome is not just the performance side, but the equipment side. Now, if you do it right, you can still get plenty of good equipment for and without breaking the bank. You don't have to have a thousand dollar microphone like this one right here. That's, you know, in my booth, but treating your space is probably one of the most important things you can do. And a lot of people will use like a walk-in closet or even their regular closet with all their clothes hanging in there. Those clothes, have you ever noticed like when you go in your closet, if you've got a walk-in closet, how dead it sounds once you step in there? That's yeah. what you're looking for. And so a lot of people will literally set up a little table in there with a microphone and their computer laptop, and they just they do their work in their regular you know, day-to-day -day closet. I started in a walk-in closet and have since you know, invested in this, in this recording booth that I'm in now. But you'd be surprised how good of a booth you can get for not too much money. Another way that people do that is they will buy, we call them PVC blanket booths, where you go down to the hardware store, you get a bunch of PVC pipe, you build a frame out of it so you can kind of be a kid again and make a big fort. And then you layer all the blankets all over it. And you'd be surprised how good that sounds. 
doesn't look doesn't look pretty, <laughs> but who cares, right? Yeah. It, only has, it doesn't have to look good. It has to sound good. And so a lot of people don't really realize that they can actually do that kind of thing for kind of pretty much on the cheap and to be up and running pretty quickly. Awesome. They think they've got to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on equipment and booths and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you really don't. So it's kind of neat. The barrier to entry is very minimal into this industry. If you've got a quiet place to record, you're well ahead a lot of a lot of people. Awesome. Well, this has been really eye-opening. I really appreciate you joining us today. So if I wanted to hire you, where would I find you? Well, you can get you can get in touch. You can send me an email at mike at mikehathcoat.com. Uh, if you want to see kind of the stuff that I've done, you can go to mikehathcoat.com. And uh, of course, I'm on LinkedIn at Mike Hathcote, and I've got all the other social channels. I'm sure if you just search them, they'll pop up yeah, there. And but, they're probably listed on your website as well. I would. Oh, imagine. they are indeed. Yeah, they're, they're all linked on there. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. And I'll put the the link to your website on this podcast once I broadcast it. So awesome! Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a pleasure having you, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much, and you t you as well. Thank you.